Hi, um, I'm going to talk to you about a physics puzzle. And um, my name is Raghu. I'm a theoretical physicist at Stanford. The Constitution of India has this Article 51A, which talks about certain fundamental duties of the citizens of India. And one of them really appeals to me. It says, it shall be the duty of every citizen of India to develop the scientific temper, humanism, and the spirit of inquiry and reform. I think this message really gets to the heart of my talk, what I want to convey to you guys. Here's the solar system. So we'll talk about the solar system. And since they are executing circular motion, including the Earth, we can ask some basic questions about the orbit. You could ask, how big is the orbit radius of the Earth? How far? That just means how far away is the sun from the Earth? And you can ask, what's the speed? How fast does the Earth go around the sun? And let's say you know those two numbers. The orbit radius of the Earth is 150 million kilometers. Orbital speed of the Earth is 30 kilometers per second. Okay, that's one planet. Let's look at another one. Let's take Mars. Let's say I tell you what the orbit radius of Mars is, but I don't tell you how fast Mars goes. Can you figure that out? That's the question. We can, of course, measure it, but is there a physics theory that will compute it just given these numbers. And similarly, you could ask, for example, for Jupiter. Jupiter is further out, its orbit radius is even bigger, 780 million kilometers. What is its orbital speed? So of course, many of you high school uh, students who have taken physics would know how to do this. And you would know well that these have been measured also, but let me just uh, make a few comments here. So of course, the answer is that there's a force of gravity the sun exerts a force of gravity on all the planets. And an important point is that almost all of the mass of the solar system is in the sun. Sun is huge. Even Jupiter, which is the largest planet, is only about 0 0.001 times the mass of the sun. Thus, to a first approximation, the only substantial force of gravity on any planet is just coming from the sun. You can ignore all the other planets. If you want to talk about the motion of the earth around the sun, you can forget about Jupiter and just, you know, might as well just focus your attention on the sun. So the sun is at the center. It exerts a force of gravity on all the planets and which execute circular orbits around the sun. Okay, so what's the answer to the question I posed on the previous slide? Given the orbital radius of any planet, what's its orbital speed? And here's a plot. So on the x-axis of this plot is the orbit radius in millions of kilometers. And on the y-axis, there is the speed in kilometers per second. So you can see Earth goes at about 30 kilometers per second, and it's at about 150 million kilometers. And uh, Mars is further away, and it moves slower. Jupiter is even further away, and it moves even slower. And I haven't written out the names, but these other three dots are Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And the two dots up here are Mercury and Venus which are closer to the sun and consequently move faster. And there's actually a very precise relationship between the speed and the radius. It's just speed is proportional to this power of R, one over square root of R. And you can just go out with a telescope or whatever equipment you have, measure the speeds and distances, and you will find this precise law, okay? And we have known all of this, and we even have a very good theory for all these facts. It was discovered all these things were known to Newton and to people before him, but Newton really gave us the theoretical foundation of how to understand these facts. And so this stuff is 300 years old, and it's really old stuff. And the scientific theory agrees with the objective measured experimental facts, and there is no room for personal feelings. So I want to highlight that we do know a lot about the universe, like predicting, you know, nine, eight numbers uh, is a big thing. I can just sit with my pen and paper, predict some number, go and measure it, and it will agree with what my theory predicted. Mm -hmm. And the next thing I want to consider bigger than the solar system is the Milky Way galaxy. So of course our solar system sits somewhere in the Milky Way galaxy. And there I have shown you sort of, if you are looking at the Milky Way galaxy from the top, like from the North Pole, how would it look? So there's a disc uh, of mass of gas of stars, like all these orange bright things are clusters of stars. We know now there's a supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy, yada, yada, yada. It's just some collection of objects 
that we see here. And basically the question I want to ask is again, the same thing about orbital radius versus speed of various objects in the galaxy. So just like the solar system, most of the mass in the Milky Way galaxy is concentrated at or near its center. It seems like it. Uh, and there are stars that execute circular orbits around the center. So we could just look with the telescopes at various objects in the Milky Way and study their speed radius curve, plot the radius on the x-axis, speed on the y-axis, and see how it behaves. And if we understood things in the solar system correctly, we should see that when we go very far out from any visible matter in the Milky Way, the speed should go down. The speed of objects far away should be smaller. Like we saw in that plot, the speed of Jupiter is smaller than the speed of the Earth and so on. Okay, so we predict something from our theory, but now let's go and see what the data tells us when we actually go and measure it. And surprise, look at the far right region of this plot. It's the same plot, the x-axis is distance. Now it's not millions of kilometers, but light years, and it's thousands of tens of thousands of light years. And on the y-axis, I still have velocity in kilometers per second. Look at this far right area. The gray line is what we would expect, the speed to decrease as we go far and far away. Whereas these blue dots are the actual data. When you do the experiment, you put a telescope in the sky and measure it. The speed is getting higher and higher and higher. That's completely the opposite of what we expected from Newton's theory of gravity. So did we get it right? I mean, we think we understood this 300 years ago. Uh, what's, what's going on? Uh, it's really a puzzle. And uh, we don't know. Uh, so the theory is not agreeing with the facts and we seem to be in a soup. What are the options? Like, you know, when you're confronted with a puzzle like this, you can say, ah, Newton's theory of gravitation is maybe wrong. Or maybe the Newton's laws of motion are wrong. But they're probably not wrong because they work in like 99 other problems. Like why did they work for the nine planets in the solar system, right? If it is wrong, then it should be wrong everywhere. And if it's right, it should be right everywhere. Another thing that you might say is that, you know, gravity works the same way for maybe apples falling on Newton's head, moon going around the earth and the earth going around the sun. But maybe when you get to big enough scales, it stops working somehow. Like that Newton's law of gravitation is not inverse square, but inverse cubed or some, something like that. But then you can ask uh, where exactly is the boundary where it breaks down? So neither of these options seem very, very convincing. And I'm going to just uh, tell you that today, what scientists believe the simplest explanation is simply the fact that not all the mass of the Milky Way galaxy is concentrated near its center. So it's not like the solar system. It's not like the sun, that the sun has all the mass of the solar system. It's in the center. And we see some uh, decrease of the speed as we go further and further up. Rather, and this is the key point, there is lots of mass distributed out in a spherical fashion. You start at the center and you distribute mass spherically outwards up to very, very large distances. As far away as you were seeing the velocity increase in that curve. And this extra mass is responsible for the extra force of gravity that you need to give these objects the higher speeds that they have. So this is the most likely explanation but uh, we don't see this extra mass. Like you say, okay, if you say there is an extra mass, then I should be able to detect it somehow, see it. However, this extra mass does not emit or absorb any light. That's why we call it dark matter. Dark matter is just a name. It's, it's the most likely explanation that is some matter out there which exerts a force of gravity, but not electricity or magnetism, because light is electromagnetic waves. So, and dark matter cannot be made of electrons, protons, or neutrons, the stuff that we are made of. I, I'm made of electrons, protons, and neutrons, because these particles have charge. The neutron has charged quarks inside it, and these charged particles emit and absorb light, and that's how we see each other. 
but this dark matter just does not interact with light at all. It does not emit or absorb light. And the only force it sees is the force of gravity. Okay, and essentially the only thing we know about dark matter is that it makes up about 26% of the energy in the universe. And that's pretty much it. So we are pretty ignorant about this stuff. Uh, I just want to emphasize that this is an old puzzle. Um, this puzzle goes back to the 1930s. The speed radius curve was first talked about in the 1930s. The data has been refined since then, but it's been almost a hundred years and no one has any clue what dark matter is made of even today. And you know, that's how science it, it, it takes, might take you a century or more even to figure out the right answer to certain problems. It's really fundamentals, 26% of the universe, and we don't know what it is. And we would really like an explanation. And several smart people have spent their whole lives trying to solve this puzzle. And just there's no luck. And you know that's life. And I just want to say that the universe and the world around us is complicated and subtle. Uh, human beings are complicated creatures. And human societies are even more complex constructs. Uh, science teaches us to be humble and patient. We looked at this example. For 100 years, we don't understand something as basic as what our universe is made up of. And so in our hunger of trying to find explanations for things that happen in the natural world or in human society, we should not rush to conclusions. And this is the main point that, one of the main points I want to emphasize, that it takes time to understand things right. And I think that this lesson is extremely relevant to a society that is hooked to social media and seeks very quick gratification and rewards. Uh, the second general lesson is that uh, religion and God are some human constructs that offer us some quick fix dogmatic answers to some of the hardest and the most troubling questions about the universe and human life and death. Why are we here? What's the purpose of human life? And so on and so forth. But I feel that clinging to a dogmatic answer is exactly the opposite of what a scientific temper and the spirit of inquiry means. So a person who possesses a scientific temper and the spirit of inquiry, when they're confronted with something they don't understand, they say something like this. I don't understand this phenomena or anything that happened around me in society or in nature, perhaps such and such is a candidate explanation, but it's definitely not the complete answer. And if I'm interested in that problem to pursue it further, I will continue to try to find an answer that is both logically consistent internally and it is consistent with all the known facts. Like that is the rational scientific temper and the spirit of inquiry kind of approach. And we see it in the example I presented to you, the solar system, something looks like some pieces of rock orbiting some huge chunk of gas, the sun, and we understand there's speed orbit curve. You can even compute more precise things and stuff like that. But when you go to the next level, to the galaxy, you suddenly are faced with this monstrosity of dark matter. Anyway, so I will leave you guys with this, uh, um, uh, fundamental duty from the Constitution of India once again. Uh, it shall be the duty of every citizen of India and I think every citizen of the world to develop the scientific temper, humanism, and the spirit of inquiry and reform. Uh, thank you very much for having me.